Going or to intrude into personal or personnel matters which are not topics uh, for us. But could I start by asking you, Mr Davey, please, to perhaps give us an update on the two pieces of work which you announced last week and uh, particularly what the timing is uh, of those uh, reports, as in those pieces of work, when, when you're expecting them to conclude and what we might see by way of publication when they are concluded. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the um, chance to update the committee. As I've said, this has been a, a difficult affair where we've tried to calmly and reasonably navigate actually some difficult concerns around al the allegations of themselves, duty of care, privacy, and legitimate public interest. As you say, we've announced, and I'm sure the committee is aware of the things we've announced in terms of the action steps. Let me just directly update you on where we're at. So the first is the fact-finding investigation, which in some ways is normal procedure for the BBC if you have allegations with regard to an individual. Uh, you look at those allegations, you go through the facts, and then as any organisation, I think, with due care and attention decides whether you are then subject, you're into any kind of process with the individual based on those facts that you have got through. We're in the process of looking at those facts and I would say we're keen to receive any information because we just want to understand anything that's out there. Um, it's difficult to give you a precise time on that. The reason is because you have to go through that diligently, assess the information. There's also duty of care concerns within that. So on that one specifically, because I'm not in control of all the variables, that could take weeks or it could take a couple of months depending on, or even longer depending on what we get and managing the individuals involved flawlessly. And, I, and I, my main priority is to be fair, make sure we get all the information into that process and act judiciously. But that process is underway, well managed with, I think, world class experts in the area that we have within the BBC. The second thing is the, clearly, in a case like this that's been difficult, you always get learning. So what I've asked for, and the committee will have seen this, and I, I think it may be worth chair me asking my chair to give you a sense of the board overview of this particular element, which is the review of protocols and procedures, including the learnings of this case, so, uh, and go through that process of understanding what we need to do in terms of are there any adjustments to our protocols and the procedures that come from this. That will be led uh, but from an executive point of view by the highly experienced Chief Operating Officer Lee Tavazia. Um, from an executive side, I'll let the Chair give you a sense of how the Board is overseeing that and actually we're involving external expertise as well to make sure um, we are properly held to account. The third thing, I just want to mention one thing if I may, which is the last thing, which is immediately I have asked for a quick look at what is red flagged to ensure consistency during the period by which we do the review. Because it would be slightly bureaucratic of me to have process running but not immediately fix some things that are obvious in terms of making sure there's consistency in what gets flagged up. So we are doing that work immediately. I didn't answer the question around timing of the second element. I think that group will report in, I'll say the autumn, maybe late autumn, that's the kind of timing I suspect. Do you want to, Damian, just uh, add to how the board is overseeing this process? Thank you very much, Joan. Um, I would like to add, because I think that the presence of the board, the board's oversight of this, the governance issue of this whole instance, and actually knowing what the executive are doing and thinking whether that is proportionate and whether it's the right form of action has been vital in this whole occurrence. So um, we, I, just, just for your information and for your sense of the uh, locus of the board in all of this. I was informed immediately by the by the director general uh, when uh, the, the the son seemed to be asking questions. Uh, the board met then on the Saturday afternoon. It met on the Sunday afternoon. I was back in London on the Monday, and I'm sorry to say I've been here ever since. 
um, and, and uh, uh, will be until Friday. So um, we are, uh, have been taking a, an, an overview of this and uh, my letter to the Secretary of State uh, has been shared with you, Chair, yes, thank you. and with the Chair of the Common Select Committee and as courtesy also with the Chair of Ofcom. Of course, Ofcom doesn't have a locus in um, this sort of non-editorial complaints, but I thought just as a courtesy to our regulator that they should be informed. Okay. So our plan of action is that uh, the Chief Operating Officer uh, takes charge of this investigation uh, with a Deloitte senior partner and I have asked whether that it's possible to name him here today, Simon Curden, who has extensive experience in this field, is a very senior partner. And I have also asked uh, Sir Nick Sarota, who is our senior independent director, to um, oversee this on behalf of the board. The terms of reference are being worked through. The terms of reference will be in front of the full board this coming Thursday, next uh, in, in, in two days' time, um, and uh, they will be published in due course and the inquiry will get underway as soon as possible. Okay. So that is will they be published straight after your board meeting? Yeah, they'll be published this week. Okay. All right, very good. Just, um, uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to come back to, particularly uh, with you, Mr Davy. but before I do, could I stick with um, you, Damilan? And it's very reassuring to know that the board met on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon when this whole matter, uh, if I can describe it, has erupted uh, the weekend before last. And... Um, I mean, clearly, as we know from uh, uh, politicians took to the airwaves, the Secretary of State uh, made it public that um, she wanted to speak to the Director General uh, directly to find out what was going on. I, I just wondered whether, you, with hindsight, you think that it would have been helpful to be able to show accountability of the BBC if there'd been more visibility of what the board was doing at that point in time? It was quite interesting because um, we had the annual report and accounts on the Tuesday. Um, and obviously we, weren't, we, we had a duty to uh, Parliament to put the annual report and accounts before you. So um, we invited, was it 40, Tim? Something like 40 journalists. They were on Zoom. Uh, I gave, as you would expect, I gave an introductory talk. I uh, gave, a, um, a, I, I took them through the process, the, uh, the, the incident that had happened, how the board was dealing with it, and then I made some further general observations about the importance of the independence of the BBC. Unfortunately, not a single paper reported on that. They were so taken. <laughs> I should have. I, I must have been naive, but they were so interested in the in the storm, in, in, you know, in the eye of the storm, that none of them actually talked about the kind of accountability that I had been talking about. Um, I then saw the uh, Secretary of State uh, on the Wednesday. That was a normal meeting, supposedly. That was one where I was sort of introducing myself. I had spoken to her on the Monday. All I can say is, you know, the Secretary of State has a complete right to opine on this issue and to make a public statement on it, and even to ring the Director General. But um, a, an opinion uh, is not a directive, and I would say that I have been put in place by the Board in order to maintain the independence of the BBC. And to me, the independence of the BBC is a bedrock of it. Independence from government, from opposition, from commercial pressures, from uh, a, a particular um, uh, uh, pr uh, uh, pieces of, of um, pe people who protest, uh, actually, our, uh, the whole issue of our impartiality as a board uh, is, uh, dwells on the fact that we are independent and that we have independence of thought and independence of, um, of, of opinion. 
Um, yes. So that, for me, is absolutely fundamental. You are right, I would have wished for the governance to have been a little bit more to the fore of our journalists' um, coverage of this, but I can't dictate that to them. No, I mean, I, I, mean you, I, I absolutely get that you can't dictate how the media reports any uh, event, but uh, I think the weekend in question where it seemed to be everybody was, uh, if I can put it this way, piling in and, and having sort of, you know, perfectly reasonable um, uh, inquiries, wanting to get reassurance that, um, you know, how is the BBC handling this matter, all that sort of thing. I mean, that the, the, the nature of their uh, interest was perfectly reasonable, but I think that it is also important for people to know that the board who has the responsibility for making sure that the interests of the licence fee payer as a whole are being properly represented, that they, that, that they are discharging their responsibilities, because that helps with the BBC's yes. independence, of yes, course. I, 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 I take your point. I also uh, want to add that we had a duty to act with some calm and rationality in the face of lack of rationality and lack of calm. There were an awful lot of questions that could not be answered. There was a huge pressure to disclose the name uh, of somebody to whom we had a duty of care and a duty of privacy, uh, in addition to the family and young man that were concerned in this maelstrom. So I was, on the one hand, seeking to establish the right of the board to oversee what was happening, but at the same time, I was trying my best to make for a calm and rational discussion of the issue before we all got carried away uh, in what could have been very wrong directions. Understood. Can I just go back to the original uh, complaint? and um, ask uh, Mr Davey, I mean, as, as uh, has already been acknowledged, um, we had Ofcom before us last week and they made clear that this is not a matter for them uh, and it's quite distinct from an editorial complaint where yeah. there might be a right of appeal uh, to yeah. them. In light of that, um, I wondered if you could uh, update us on what is the current situation as far as the original complainants are concerned, as in, is the BBC still in contact with them and do they understand the process that is being followed and what they can expect once it is completed? Thank you. Yeah, Inevitably, I, I know you go so far because I want to protect privacy here. Let me just say, I, since the, that weekend that we've been discussing, we have been in touch with the complainant and obviously we want to be engaged and appropriately listening and understanding concerns. Okay, but that, that you're in contact with, with them? I've just confirmed we've yes. spoken. Okay, um, no, that's, that, that, no that's, that, that's helpful to know. And, uh, and as part of the review that is being carried out on the protocols and the procedures of handling this sort of mm. thing, um, I just wondered if there was anything more that you wanted to add about the difference of complaints handling of this kind versus editorial complaints, because I think most of us, you know, are very sort of quite clear and confident in how editorial complaints get handled, but this one's sort of somewhat different. Yeah, so I mean, we have, um, as you know, we we sometimes get to hundreds of thousands of complaints on various scheduling issues and questions of um, tennis is the latest, um, uh, uh, you know thing that most people, are, we've had more complaints on tennis than any other item, certainly in the last few weeks, um, in terms of scheduling. So you've got all that coming through and the, we can talk about it in more detail, but the process by which, as you know, Chair, and, and well versed in terms of the various stages of that, which I can talk people through, stage two and then to Ofcom. We then have um, complaints of this nature that come in that might be serious allegations, but we have a, a lot coming into the BBC. We're a huge organisation, we have different things, some are malicious, some may be small issues, but potentially big issues, so that is a difficult thing to judge for coming into our audience services centre. If they have something uh, that they, they have a concern around that clearly needs to be looked at, that gets passed to our corporate incidents, uh, sorry, investigations team. So we have very experienced people who have a perfect background for this, let's just say, in terms of uh, their experience levels, and they look at what to do with what they've got in front of them in terms of that contact um, and the information they've got. And then they will decide how to treat that, whether it's 
obviously a serious case, whether there's clear allegations of criminality, a number of factors they'll look at um, and see how they deal with that matter. That will then, um, they'll then work through that and then deal with that appropriately in terms of how it goes through, whether it could lead to a fact finding and disciplinary, or it might go to the authorities, they, or it might be dropped. They're the kind of things that we go through with that group. Okay. And I guess final question from me on uh, this topic is that, um, I suppose just following on from that, generally speaking, when it comes to the highest profile and highest paid presenters, what can you tell us about how BBC management holds them to account for the responsibility they have for upholding the BBC's reputation? And I stress I'm speaking generally rather than anybody speaking. Of course, of course. And look, I've spoken before publicly, and I think the, the history of this industry is such that we should all be concerned and appropriately diligent around the abuse of people in powerful positions. And certainly you have a dynamic when you've got presenters or even you know, people in power, you need to ensure that you're very, very clear on what your expectations are culturally as well as the policy. Now, I think we've done really good work at the BBC, and I'm proud actually of the work we've done over the last few years, having a really clear code of conduct, our values. I mean, we've done a real, a very big push on what our values are as an organisation. We've got, I think, a good process we could do more with it, but we've got a good process which we've introduced, which does, if, if you've got a concern at work, you can, the normal route obviously is to your line manager, but that is not always where you can go. That might be where a problem is. So then we have another uh, route, which is our support at work line, which is you can just ring up HR, not connected with your line management. But critically, the thing we've introduced, and I, I'm, and I am proud of it, I think it, it is working, but we've got more to do in making sure everyone's confidence in it. We've got most people very confident in it, but we need to keep working on it. There's still gaps in that. And this is, I think, normal when you're, when you're deploying these, these things, which is our whistleblowing process, which is external and confidential. So someone doesn't want to give them, and that process I can talk in more detail another time, or if the committee wants to get into that in more detail, I'm more than happy to. But that process has been introduced and actually is a route by which people can go all the way, that could get raised to the non-exec director or even external company. So there's a safe place they can go to raise concerns and we track that. And I think in terms of transparency, there's not many organisations that would put that in their annual report. And we do have that annual, annual report and we're more than happy to track it Obviously, I can't talk about the individual cases and, the, and everything that's going in there, but I do think we've got a good process. Okay. I wonder if I could just add here that uh, one of the reasons for asking Sir Nick, Nick Sirota, although you know, he's a very distinguished man in his own right, one of the reasons for asking him to be involved with this uh, investigation that we are under, which is underway is that he is also on our board, not only our senior uh, independent director, but uh, the board member with their responsibility for overseeing the whistleblowing arrangements. Okay, but to be, just to be specific about it, in terms of serious uh, high profile uh, presenters who hold in their hands or, or have on their shoulders you know, serious responsibilities when it comes to the reputation of BBC, there is in their contracts generally something which is about disrepute. Yes. Yes. Good, okay. Um, we may want to pick up on governance uh, uh, framework more generally when we're coming to other um, questions as we, as we proceed through. But what I'm going to do now is to, if you like, draw a, a, a pause under this part of the hearing and move to the main substance of the reason why we invited you here. And, um, and as I said at the start, this is a follow-up to the inquiry that this committee conducted last year into B BBC Future Funding and, and the report that we published uh, a year ago exactly today as it happened. And uh, in our report, we, um, some of the findings that uh, were there was, uh, I think, uh, important that we were able to depoliticise this question about BBC Future Funding. Uh, and we were able to, to, which was one of the main aims, really, to get away from this position, which was, you know, no BBC, no licence, uh, no licence fee, no BBC. Um, and, uh, and what we as a cross-party and non-party select committee of Parliament 
uh, was able to establish was that this future funding is a, is a serious question for all sorts of reasons in terms of the pressures on uh, the BBC and deciding how it should be funded into the future is becoming increasingly urgent, which is why it's good to see that the government uh, seems to now be uh, moving on that according to today's uh, media reports. And what we collectively uh, concluded was that uh, the status quo was not an option. So even if it was decided that the licence fee should remain the way of funding the BBC into the future, that that too would uh, need to change. Um, and we looked at various models. Now, as part of our report, we made some specific recommendations to the BBC, and that's what we want to focus on uh, in this uh, session today. And uh, with that, I'm going to move over to uh, Baroness Harding, who will kick us off. Thank you, Chair. So, so as, as our Chair's just said, a year ago today, we published our uh, report entitled Licence to Change. Um, in it, uh, we argued that the BBC should use the debate um, of it, on its future funding to embrace the challenges, embrace the opportunities, and generate momentum towards that change. And in doing so, that the BBC should set out a long-term vision and plan. Um, last October, Mr Davey, you um, were in front of us again, and you said then that you were overseeing, and I quote, a detailed strategic review of the BBC that would take some time. It's now another nine months on. Uh, I, I wonder if you could update us on that work. Thank you. And the, the question is utterly fair, and <laughs> I realise there's a smidgen of frustration in the room in terms of where we are on that. And I would say just as a, a quick overview, I think it is important that we see the funding sitting un, underneath that bigger question, which is, what is the BBC's, what's the BBC's role? And, and I wouldn't put this into the next charter, which is, as the world is moving so fast, if we look at our, I don't think there's a problem with the mission and the purposes, but I do think we need to be clearly articulate what our role is as this world is changing so fast. And then you have the questions of funding. I would say we're not... I'm not positioning this in the way that we do all the strategic work and then we don't do any work on funding to, while that is going on. I'll explain what I mean by that because we've already started some work which Claire can take you through on the funding question. We're also absolutely supportive of the government doing their fun work on our funding and we're encouraging that based on your very wise report which said essentially we need to look at options, it's not easy. If you want to protect universality, the licence fee has a lot of benefits, but to echo what the Chair said, I think we want to look at the options. We have on the funding side laid out a few principles which we think from the BBC perspective we are, is important, which we may want to get to in a minute. Let me then dial back up to the strategy if I may, and I apologise it's taken a bit of time, we've had a, a fairly change, a change at the board level, if I can put it that way. We've also been doing quite a lot of work. And we're not, we, we sense the urgency, but it is really important for the committee to know that we have, I think, an outstanding day-to-day -day strategy that if you look at the 22-23 report, has delivered strong numbers for the BBC. While there are challenges on the licence fee, our income's only down 1.6%, and actually, competitively, the BBC's had a really good year, if you look at the annual report, in terms of its drama, its events, its news coverage. So I don't think there's a burning crisis in terms of the current working strategy. Having said that, I think what you're going to see for us in the next few months, and I'll say by year end to make sure I'm safe, is we do want to come and come out with some work and some communication about how we see in a world in which there's increased disinformation, 70% of the world doesn't have a free press. I mean, this is a serious global crisis. We have some big decisions to make about the role of the BBC. Now, to give you a little kind of indication of the kind of things we're going to be talking about, I think there's a real battle now for a, an organisation which has no agenda but to find the truth and to report impartially. And you know I've made that decision. It's not been the easiest decision, but it's the right one to keep the BBC impartial for all the noise around us. And this last few weeks. I mean, it's so noisy, but we have made that decision, and I think that will get more valuable, and actually we can use technology to help us with that. The second area that dis makes us completely distinctive is around homegrown talent. 
We develop talent. We're not just trying to get return on investment on our drama series. We're trying to get the right creative work and make a creative contribution. And critically, if you look at our numbers of across the UK, we are now more spread across postcodes across the UK than we've ever been. Most of our successful dramas are really anchored in place like Happy Valley. You know, we are doing great work and we're pushing more and more money outside. And I think that's gonna be part of our strategy for the future. The last thing is, in an algorithmic world, you are getting more and more isolation echo chambers. One of the things we do is we have a personal relationship, hopefully all of you do with the BBC of depth, but we are unique in bringing people together via our funding rather than trying to just monetize and chase the market. We don't have to chase the market. So I'm trying to give you a sense of the territory we're gonna lay out and we will be doing that in the next few months. I appreciate and I, I'm very aware of it that that has been a little longer than we wanted it to, but I think we've got really strong leadership with the board now and we're ready to go. If I could just take a couple of follow-up um, questions. I would mind if I added a little bit to that, a sort of colour of where I see this strategic work taking place. Um, I think it's very, very important to distinguish between the purposes of the BBC, as enshrined in the Charter, and a reinvention of the model in order to meet the times. And I think with your background, Baroness Harden, you know, I, I would just like to um, talk through just a little bit of how I see that. Um, and if I may be a, a touch historical here, you know, the, the BBC has just celebrated its 100 years. And it has survived because it has been able to reinvent itself for different ages every time that there has been a technical challenge. From radio to television, from television to multi-channels, from multi-channels to iPlayer, library, browsing, on demand rather than linear. And now we're in a metaverse and in an AI situation where people are so finely attuned to what is being thrown at them or how they're being drawn into different uh, um, uh, 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 situations. I think it's time once again for us to look uh, at the kind of iPlayer offer which I think should be far more sophisticated, far more part of this new age. Now the challenge for us in terms of our funding and our future is that we have to ride two horses. Unlike Netflix and the libraries and the streamers, we cannot leave people behind. It's a little bit like the high street banks, if you like. You know, you've got to keep one branch open somewhere and you've also got to have an online offer because that is where the future is leading. So I think what I'd just like to draw apart and just sort of make clear is that we are not reinventing the purpose of the BBC. We are trying to reinvent the offer and I think... Um, in the past, I've read um, Baroness Stoll's points to the VLB on uh, left behind people, and people who may not be engaging with the BBC at the level that we would want them to be engaged. And one of the ways of getting there is not a top down, we think you will like this, but, but a sort of a nudge of an offer that will, through the algorithms, make you come back for more. That is the sweeter way of doing it. However, underpinning all that must be the principles because if we get drawn into just a volume game, then we are not the BBC that, that, that we are. And so for me, the funding, forgive me for taking a bit of time, uh, for me, the funding kind of follows what you're trying to do. So if what you're trying to do is to remain universal, so that everybody has something from this, then it follows that a funding model has to also bring us together in some ways, rather than splitting us apart. So I would say, let's do the form, you know, let's do the, the, the function of the BBC, the way we see ourselves in the future, which we will be coming back and, and 
public and um, uh, publicising and, and uh, sharing with everybody, and and then to see what 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 model and what um, level of finance uh, that requires. Well, and certainly you're you're preaching to the choir to this committee. In yeah. in we we wanted in our report to encourage you to set out what that plan should be uh, in order to inform the funding discussions rather than the other way round. So I'm very encouraged to hear that. Uh, can I take it from what you said that you will be publishing a strategy or a plan, whatever words we want to use to describe uh, yeah. it by Christmas? Uh, yes. Fantastic. Um, can I just ask one clarifying question, and then my colleague over, uh, over the other side of the hall, she's going to follow up on those points about universality, I think. Um, in, I think it was, it was probably at the Royal Television Society, I may have misremembered, in the autumn last year, um, I think, Mr David, you talked about um, the BBC becoming a digitally-led public service media company. I, I would say that that is quite, that is a subtly different role than maybe the BBC of 100 years ago, and, and yet you haven't used any of those words in the last five minutes. I just wonder if you can join up that sort of big vision speech that you gave ne nearly a year ago with what you've described, which sounds a bit more tactical. The, spe the speech was a broad, a broad plea that we don't look backwards as public service broadcasters, and I say broadcasters with, in the plural as well, because I was looking at the market and almost entrenching into this. And by the way, this is such a difficult game. I do enjoy it, but it's a really difficult game in terms of how we ensure we bring people along, but also repurposing an organization whose funding has been cut, I'm sorry, by 30% in the previous decade, and now another 400 million based on inflation. So this is a, so we have big questions on how do you do that on limited funding? And I think we're actually pulling it off. Now, what I was trying to do there, and it does, I forgive the language link not being there, it's utterly, it's utterly linked, which is what I was trying to say was the purposes, and I think we need to do more on this, which is because I think actually what's happened in that intervening months is we're beginning to see how technology is both a threat but a huge opportunity in terms of what that digitally-led organisation is. See, we don't have to chase the market. We can choose to use AI and algorithms, look at verification, look at what we did on the story with the Greek migrant boat, with new technology, with fantastic R&D capability to understand what's going on in the story. So that is a digitally led organisation, but it's working against its purposes. What I was trying to do in that speech was try and jolt us all, say, look, over time, this is, I know, I know I spooked people slightly on the digital switch over side. But over time, people are moving to an on-demand media, ha media habits. 65, I think 65 to 74 year olds, main source of news is online. Yeah, main source of local news, sorry, is online. Yeah, we are moving. So I wanted to make sure the BBC is not confusing its purposes with the means of delivery and have an organisation that was very set up just to fill broadcast slots. What we will set out in the autumn is absolutely linked to that. I, I take the point on the language. We've just got to make sure that bridge is clear. Okay, thank you. Lord Foster. Uh, uh, it is perfectly possible to consider funding models without having decided what the BBC is for and in a sense our report did that uh, because we did look and say that Basically, an advertising, solely advertising model would not work, wouldn't bring in enough money. We said that subscription was not really viable and would certainly lead to all sorts of access problems for people. But our fundamental point was, as, uh, as has been said, very clear that if you're going to make final decisions, then you need to be absolutely clear not only what the BBC is for, but also how it's going to deliver that vision. And you've been very clear. Uh, that you're going to work on that. Um, I think I would share a degree of disappointment that we're having to wait so long uh, for it, but you've explained the other pressures you're under. But, I mean, my first very quick question, I have some more detailed ones, my first very quick question is, given all these media stories that the government is going to conduct their own review into funding models, do you think they should be advised to wait until after your report has been produced? 
Um, not, not necessarily, because I think we, this work is going to take some time, uh, and I don't think we're unclear about what are the, what the, it's a bit like you were saying about your report, which I think there are some things that are, and it relates, relates to the chair's point around the overall purposes of the BBC, which mean you may be debating funding levels to a point, but you cannot break the funding mechanic from the editorial vision of an organisation. Advertising leads you in a completely different direction and subscription leads you in a completely different direction. And we have set out five clear principles, which you may or may not have seen, in terms of what we see a funding mechanic in any circumstances has to deliver. You know, does it deliver the mission of the BBC? Because we have a mission through our charter. Does it deliver that? Does it safeguard our impartiality and our independence? And some funding models do not do that. Does it provide a sustainable financial model? We've seen around the world, and I, I really think one of the things that most people should do is go and have a look at public service broadcasters and travel outside the, the UK and see how precious what we have is and how fragile public service broadcasting is and free media around the world. We, we, with respect, we're in our bubble. We, we've got major problems around the world in terms of free, the free press and public service media. So does it provide a sustainable financial model? Because you cannot plan year to year mm -hmm. the kind of navigating the changes. Does it help the creative economy grow? I've always, as a leader, been very clear in my job that I am not here to defend the BBC wholly as an institution. That is not my sole job. My job is to grow the... I'm fiercely passionate about this. Grow the creative industries. The BBC has to be accretive to a commercial, thriving, creative sector. And if you talk to most of the commercial businesses in the, in the sector, they see us as accretive to their businesses. Not everyone. We have some fun and games with certain bits of the companies or whatever. But overall, one, we, we should be celebrating a wonderful sector that's outstripped the market, put in jobs. And it's because we've got a curious and wonderful blend of public intervention and private enterprise. So I, any solution to me has to do that. And the last is, does it deliver fair value for audiences? My job is not just to get the licence fee as high as possible, it's to make sure that we get the support for it and people want to pay it and think it's great value. And, and that is, I think that construct with respect will hold regardless of where we end up in terms of where we focus this institution. And I don't want to stop the work going on. And I think you proved that in your analysis you could begin to fence out some of those arguments while we do our work. And just to reinforce, we have a good strategy in the BBC around value for all, and you can track us against it. We're delivering pretty well versus competition in terms of the share of iPlayer. I, I won't bore you with all that. Our competitive performance on commercial, we're doing pretty well. We've got some threats like every media player. So this isn't a situation where we're on our knees. This is about future. And we want to, it's not just simply that we've had a bit of chop that we've delayed doing this. We also, want to get it right, want to take our time, set a proper course. It's very important. Can I just pursue one? I mean, and that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of those was fair value for audiences. And of course, the question is, who is your audience? Um, and whether it is um, universal uh, and so on. And you may well recall that when you uh, last came before Indeed. us, uh, we explored with you uh, the whole issue of universality and what it meant. You yourself admitted that you could probably go away and work on your answer. You had over a year. I wonder what your answer is now. Thank you. Um, I do recall very well that particular voyage into the topic of universality and the semantic challenges it provided. But we've done some work and we think our definition of universality means that the work you're doing passes three thresholds. It's not single, it's not singular. Let me explain what I mean. And we think those three things are, it must be relevant to all audiences, the, the work you create, not just the wealthy. Yeah? And it's, it's the relevant, there's, there's a big thing here, which is not just, even before you start to measure what you're doing, what is your intent? Are you trying to bring people in or are you trying to monetize an audience? And part of universality is the editorial 
desire to be relevant to everybody. The second thing is, are you accessible? So can people get hold of your output and making sure everyone can assess, access the BBC? We do not want to be closed off to individuals who, by definition of, they're, they're, they're basically cut away from the BBC and they cannot get hold of it. And that universal broadcast coverage is critical. And we could talk, it would be a useful conversation, I think, to have around digital access, by the way, and our role in that, because I am worried about that in terms of, the, as, as we move through the next few years. And the last thing is then, it's not enough in our view to say, look, we make for everyone, we're accessible, but we're not being used or regularly engaging our audiences. Because I think that lets us off the hook and doesn't allow us to deliver that value. So our third test in universality is, are we regularly reaching and engaging everyone in the UK with our services? And at the moment, seven out of 10 adults are using us daily, nine out of 10 are using us weekly, and 96% are using us every month. And I can tell you, I look at those numbers weekly with the board, assessing how we're doing, because that's at the end of the day is where the action is. Thank, thank you. I, I'd love to pursue more, but I know the colleagues want to come in. And I suspect Baroness Fraser might pursue your relevant to everyone claim, but uh, that's for her later. Indeed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Lord Griffiths. Um, I'm, I'm aware that uh, we catch you unforeseeable for you or us at a particular time where you're reeling with stuff that's been thrown at you. Um, and you have to cope as best you can. And you're facing the expectations of a committee like this that has challenged you um, to embrace the future, to be on the front foot, to have a vision and to go for it. And uh, I feel I like want to just commend what I've heard so far as Thank suggesting you. to me that that's, that's where you find yourselves. Um, my question is simply um, that I would like to hear the third voice. Um, um, I mean, uh, she's been mentioned in dispatches once, but I wondered if, if, if Claire Sumner would like to, to add, from her point of view as the Director of Policy, um, anything to what we've heard so far. Uh, thank you, Lord Griffiths. I, I think I would like to echo that strategically we are focusing on how do we evolve the BBC. And one of the things that is really striking when you talk to European public service broadcasters is, of course, the BBC is the only PSB that operates globally, nationally across the UK and locally. And therefore we have quite a special place in the heart of the UK, but also through the World Service and some of the British uh, great content that we export in the world itself. And so if I may say so, that the kind of the eyes of the European Broadcast Union and other PSBs are on us. But in terms of the approach that we're taking, we're obviously looking at all of those five tests that Tim set out. And then we're also going back to some of the previous work that we've done before around, for example, the over 75s, where we looked at kind of three main areas, which actually reflect what we're talking about, which is when you think about fairness, there are several elements to that. One is value, which is at the core of the BBC strategy. The second, and this I think the committee gave some very helpful insight on, was around is the licence fee a regressive tax? Should we do more on progression? Are there things we should look at to support lower incomes? And at the moment, actually, on over 75s, we support over 900,000 uh, households there through a combination of being linked to pension credit and also through a combination of some people in designated care homes. So there are some precedents for these things. Interestingly, when you look at places like Germany uh, or even some of the other countries, most countries operate a flat fee. They're not really progressive unless you're linked to taxation or in the case of Finland, as you know, a personal levy. And the other thing I think we have to do in this debate is set this in a UK cultural context. The other issues that we're looking at are the financial scale that Tim talked about. And actually, some of these models increase the numbers of households. So a universal levy potentially increases the number of households. And other models potentially change that picture. And finally, how do we operationalize these things? So how do we put independence at the heart of the BBC but also how do we do this in a feasible way? And when we looked at over 75's implementation, that took us over two years to move around four million people from one system to another. Now we did do that quite successfully and we moved nine over, out of 10 people 
over that period, and that was during COVID. So that was quite a difficult period for the BBC. The other key element in this debate going forward is the government will do their review, which we welcome and we will engage with. It's perfectly possible that as part of that process, or indeed on our own, the BBC, and I think you were challenging us to think about this, will need to put what we think and the assessment and the work that we have done. Yeah. Now, I haven't got a timetable for that today, and you can see the sort of structure that probably the strategy would come first, but we are highly conscious that that's what we've got to do. And then there's a third, possibly the most important element of this, which is the role of the public and our audiences. In all of the consultations around the BBC, they've always attracted over 100,000 people. So the last charter review from the government, I think the figure was 190,000. Mm. When the BBC consulted on over 75s, it was 190,000. People care deeply about these things, and we will need the public to inform us about what do they think about the role of the BBC going forward and also how it should be funded. And then ultimately, this decision will rest with government and parliamentarians. And you know, we are not saying, for example, that we don't think we should have a careful look. The licence fee, just like Alain's history of actually how the BBC's changed, the licence fee too has evolved with technology. Most recently in 2016 with the iPlayer and ensuring that that was part of what your licence fee paid for. Nothing is in aspic, but all options need to be on the table, including looking at the current one, but including at looking at radical things as well. And we're open for that, and we're doing detailed work now. We're not in a position to be able to share that. But as I'm sure you can appreciate, that's partly because we want to look at this from all the angles. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, as an over 75-year-old, I thought I needed to hear what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would, if, oh, Chris. Uh, if I might right. just add a little bit. Um, I just think that we, we've all, all of us together, have got to get this right. Because, uh, I don't, that's a platitude, but let me just stay with it for a moment. Um, we are going to project a form of BBC and a funding model for 10 years from April 2028. Now, in view of the acceleration of change within uh, our whole world, in fact, I would almost say a new industrial revolution that is on us, you know, we have got to be as open-minded and intelligent and ambitious as we can be in order to put something in place in, 20, in 28 which will be flexible enough, open-ended enough and uh, interesting enough to take us through massive, massive change such as perhaps we haven't seen in our lifetime, although, you know, being my age, I think uh, I have seen enormous change, but this one, I think, is something yeah. of a different order. Yeah. So we've just got to get it right. I welcome everything you've done. You've set out options uh, for the public. I'm glad that the government is... Um, going to have a look at, uh, again. I um, hope the public will take an interest. I hope the various pressure groups will take an interest. I hope that together, you know, we can come to a conclusion about what we want and how we're going to pay for it. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to move on, but I know Lord Young, you've got an opportunity to raise a question under very, the, the very next uh, under the next group of questions. Do you want to hold it back for that? No, because it relates to the stats that uh, Mr. David. You gave us the, but you didn't break it down into the age demographics. Yep. I do think, as you know, that that younger generation is absolutely key. And I'm sure you've got those stats. <laughs> but I'd be um, interested. Yeah, the, 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 thank you for the question. The, the stats that I've given you is 90% of all adults, you know, and we, we bob around between 80, 85-ish. Now, that's all adults. Actually, that number is not a massively lower among 16 to 34s and young people in terms of their overall reach once a week or once a month to the BBC. The significant challenge, because they'll come in for Eurovision, they'll come in for a tennis match, they'll come in. The, the challenge for us in management speak is habitual usage. So how many times they're coming in a week, how many hours, so we're definitely hitting them. We've got the biggest revision service in the UK, bite size, that's had a very good few months. So we are impacting them. It's a question of 
are we locked into habitual uses? So I'm hopeful many of you around the uh, committee room will have your habitual usage of, may I suggest something like the Today programme, or whatever your pleasure is, Radio 3, if you're that way inclined. Yeah, I, I have a lot of, that is what locks value for the licence fee in. So being very you know, direct with you, the biggest challenge is making sure that habitual usage is locked in. I think over time, actually, we may have slightly less time because that's inevitable when there's infinite choice. But actually, our importance is going to be as high as ever to know where the truth is, to understand what the community is doing as a whole, to get your local news. And I'm actually quite optimistic that so-called young people want that as well. And what we do need to do is make sure and one of the biggest challenges that we need to be clear about is how do we get the capital and how do we get the right funding to ensure we are defying gravity at the moment in terms of the outstanding work of people delivering the, the iPlayer. We're in the game with massive US companies with huge battles for engineering talent, for coding talent. I am paying significant discounts and that is sensitive even itself. I'm sure we may cover that, I don't know, but later on the committee. How do we ensure we, create, we are competitive in terms of digital product development, all of that, so that we can push through the wonders that we do into that system? We, we, we've done a pretty good job, but I think the jeopardy is quite high, and that relates to the strategy as well in terms of what we need to do to make sure our products, like iPlayer, like the various things, are still in the game in 10 years' time. Okay, we're going to move on uh, to some of the more contemporary decisions and challenges that you face anyway. So, Lord Bishop. Thank you. Um, there have been some interesting um, uses of language. The new industrial revolution totally endorsed this. But the thing about revolutions is that they're, they're a process rather than just an event. Yeah. And this means that not everybody moves at the same pace. We've heard about fair value for audiences. Um, without specifically saying uh, which audiences get the most fair value. Now, one of the things um, that you're facing in the BBC with funding challenges and choices such as Digital First, which again makes perfect sense, is um, what about those audiences that are not moving at the same pace, the linear audiences? Because if fair value simply means we tick a box, for the Luddites, you know, we've got to keep them on, on side somehow, rather than that being substantial value in the broadcasting that you do. And secondly, perhaps touching on uh, what we may follow up on local radio, um, the, you talked about universality, but one of the things we discovered, for example, during COVID, was the importance of the local. Yeah. And it seems to me that there might be a tension here in the direction of travel and in, in respect of your policy or strategy and what's actually happening in wider society in relation to community. And I wonder if um, particularly um, Ms. Sumner and um, Mr. Davey, if you could just respond to that. I think in terms of the first point on fair value, absolutely fair value for all audiences. And that's part of the way that you have to look at universality, that in effect, particularly that relevance, will come to give something to everybody, but not necessarily meaning that you have to give it all to the same, same people and the same group. I think the other really important thing to, to recognise behind fair value is, of course, when you look at the price points of the licence fee compared to some of our competitors, ensuring that that is competitive and ensuring that they are feeling that they're getting great value for their licence fee. And it's really notable that from time to time we do deprivation studies where we take the BBC away from people who don't love us, who actually say they don't really use it very much. And then when it comes to that process, actually they miss quite a lot of the BBC uh, and they then want it back again. And then you hand them in effect that, you know, it's 44p a day currently and they say, blimey, we didn't realise that actually that great value for the BBC uh, is what we're getting. And Tim, if I... To you, yeah, I don't then want to, then you wanted yeah. to say something, and then I might want to say something as well, because these are really good questions, and they're, they're the heart of the debate in terms of our Thank choices. You. I, I think you've described beautifully <laughs> the tensions that will always exist within so, a universal broadcaster. I mean, these are the sorts of debates that the board 
has to have, and of course we're a unitary board, so we have members of the executive and non-executives, and we are all engrossed with a balance between what it is to be um, a global and a, a world-class broadcaster selling uh, some of its IP uh, abroad uh, very successfully, and of course the local and the particular. So let me just answer your first part of it. When I talked about what is universality and, and what is our new vision, I, I was referring to, I, I made an analogy with the banks <laughs> and I said, you know, we, we have to, have, we have to uh, ride two horses. We cannot leave people who are digitally deprived. I come from Wales. I mean, there are patches of Wales which still have um, almost dial-up yeah. in terms yeah. of yeah. accessibility. It's, it's a terrible thing to say in this digital age. And that was amplified during COVID as well. The yeah. have and have nots of Absolutely. the people who were able to access education at home and those, uh, and those who, who couldn't. So by being paid for um, on a universal basis, we have a universal obligation and we cannot leave. However, I think the sh gradual shift over time of resources is one that has to be very carefully managed. And as you say, part of tension, uh, com a tension uh, which it will not be resolved. These, right. are, these are things which will carry on. In terms of the okay. local, I think you're absolutely right. COVID, COVID um, emphasised for us the, as our localness and, and the care we had for each other. But it also emphasised for us the, the, the ultra-national, the, the umbrella uh, the Prime Minister, for example, the then Prime Minister's address to the nation, I think brought in 15 million people, if I remember rightly, on that night when he told us all to stay at home. So there's also a much bigger picture than the local. And then there's the national, there's the nations. Um, for example, we were delivering during COVID um, the curriculum in bite size to Scotland, Wales, England, Northern Ireland, which all have different school curriculum and different emphases, and we were doing it for all of them. So, again, it's not just the tension between local and global, it's local, national, you know, nations, regions, and all of that is the responsibility. Ultimately, it's the responsibility of the governance of the system to weigh those things in balance and to satisfy our license fee pays yeah. that we are being fair. I think what I'm guessing at yeah. is the um, ease with which people assume a way of seeing the world that can change very radically. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, 10 years ago, people were saying we now live in networks, we don't live in localities, everything's mm -hmm. online and all of that. And then you discover that we do because we're awesome. physical awesome. people. And um, I just, if I can just follow it up, you used the word, Mr. Davy, earlier about you know, semantic challenges you had last time you came and I wasn't <laughs> here. Um, is universality uh, or universalism, is that a bit of a weasel word in that, uh, a bit like inclusion, um, which is a word I never use because it simply includes the people who agree with my definition of inclusion, mm -hmm. which is automatically by definition exclusive is universality or universalism um, a good aspiration but it hides the need for discrimination um, i'll move to some specifics because we're getting very very esoteric in this <laughs> well it, it it underlies i i, I don't use language i i don't see of itself it we, a weasel word actually i think it is the right aspiration so I really don't think it's a weasel word in that. I don't think the, mm. the issue is it's fiendishly complex then to, and, and this is, you, your, your summary is absolutely how we are as guardians of the BBC during our tenure are trying to get the balance right mm. between delivering and making sure everyone, I mean, I want to super serve people. And, and sometimes, by the way, people outside the BBC who may not be that friendly ascribe all kinds of objectives to us. Commercialisation, we don't want the old. It's 
Which, forgive, forgive me, it's nonsense. What we want to do is make sure we are delivering value across the people who pay for it. Now, the reason that is fiendishly, I'm not looking for sympathy, but the, the reason it's fiendishly complicated is this whole notion in corporate world of return on investment of 3.7 billion, okay? And in a commercial operation, and this is why the funding model is so important, in a commercial operation, the return on investment is very straightforward. It's profitability, then everything else follows from that. And I've run commercial businesses, and believe me, there are other challenges, but that bit's quite easy. This is a multi-variable game. And when we talk about local and other things, we, we have got a complex set of filters. They're not impossible to manage. It's what's the best way to spend that money that results in usage. This is really important, because I said the last thing on university is it being used, because what we don't want to do is do all the right things, but they're not watched or not used. I know that sounds obvious, but I talk to people, and we know that the license fee, guess what, is supported by people who use the BBC. This is important, because we're not just a market failure organisation. Therefore, we need to be relevant, we need to make sure we're in the channels of distribution that people are at. Yeah, and that means the traditional linear channels, but also if people want their news on, online, we need to be there. And this puts enormous strain on our finances as we transform and make sure we don't leave anyone behind. And what we're trying to do is not just chase ratings, but try and triangulate public service with maximum impact. Like, where do you spend your money? That means we do make some choices. We'll talk about local. But our intent is to keep the high standards of public service broadcasting, but not leave people behind at all, ever. But sometimes make some adjustments on how thick the provision is in one distribution set. Yeah. And that's the game. That's the game. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, Brian is healing. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, we understand the financial constraints, but I'm just wondering how you do respond to the concerns that the restructuring of local radio will lead to worse services for audiences. And the criticism particularly emphasises that it will impact on local communities and there has been a lack of consultation and that the impact on black and Asian audiences and also the ra local radio staff. So there's a, a whole gamut of uh, criticisms. And I just like to give you a chance to address them. Of course, and we spent... And just to add to that, I think the other thing which was just to pick up on uh, where we were going before with uh, little Bishop's question and this one is that my, my, my desire for a bit more specificity was because we know that Ofcom has criticised the BBC for a, a lack of clarity around some of uh, its decisions and the impact that has on uh, certainty for audiences and that sort of thing. But um, Under Understood. Well, firstly, local, I mean, local is an utterly critical and essential part of the BBC's offer and will probably become more important. If you look at what holds democracies together, absolutely to your point, by the way, I won't, don't start me on that or I'll get the esoteric warning, but the, uh, justifiably, but the, the absolutely, if you look at what we should be backing, we should be backing local connections, local news, all of the things we, believe, we, we deliver. So we've made a choice, which is, even though our budget is under enormous pressure, we will keep investment in local. That's the first thing. We'll keep investment in local. What we do think, however, is you do need to move some of that money, and it's a minority of that money from linear to online because in most places I love local radio I think they do an outstanding job the connection is fantastic we have brilliant people in local radio but if you take if you go to a city in the UK on average about 15 percent will listen to local radio so if you went out on the street 15 percent listen to local radio and the connection with them is outstanding but I worry that we need to make sure that local news is not just trapped in linear radio, but we have the right current affairs capability. We have, I think our online offer needed to be upweighted. So we are making some choices and we cannot do it all. And this is why it's painful. If I had more money, I, could, I, didn't, I wouldn't have to make these choices. But what we have chosen to do, as you know, is in the afternoon, so when 70% of the listening is to the mornings and the things we're protecting the sport, what we are doing in the afternoon is we're moving to 20, not 39 programmes. That is not ideal, and it's incredibly painful. And I understand if you're one of those people who listen to those shows, it is difficult. 
but I do think it is right in a media organisation to move some money across from linear services to make sure we're not for them you know most of audiences over 55 are now getting their news from online now I know the companionship of local radio is precious I would love to keep all the services but what I can't do on my tenure is at the end of a few years say we didn't keep local relevant and that is that is I, I'm it's really tough and it the the, the <coughs> organization is significant and I care about it, but it's the right decision. Thank you. I wonder if Dave Mellon would like to add to that. You're talking about there must be at least one bank left on the local high street. I mean, is, is there a danger for older people particularly to, have, to miss out if everything begins to go online? I, I know the morning programmes are preserved. I think we, we were very concerned that the time from the early morning through the drive programmes, through that precious time of 10, 11, 12, uh, uh, up to lunchtime. You know, that is the, uh, the crux of the, of the listening to ra uh, local radio and the way in which you inform yourself about your community. Um, I would still say that even with the reduction, 20 different programmes in the afternoon is more than anybody else offers. And speech radio is really... Uh, we are the only people providing long-term, constant speech radio, which is differentiated for all local localities. I understand that in order to uh, do the online offer, we have to take money from that afternoon and from that late evening. And I appreciate, I, I do appreciate that there may be people who feel a sense of loss in that. But we also have to make certain that uh, our other audiences actually believe the BBC is a worthwhile institution in terms of their knowledge of their own community. Because quite often, the uh, afternoon or nighttime programmes might not be as factual about your community. Yeah. So, just, just before I uh, invite Lord Young to ask his question, if I, if I may, because I'm just conscious of time and we've got various things that we haven't yet. Of but if, of particularly on this question, if I may, Damilan, is could you, could you give some sense very briefly how the board takes account of the market impact questions of these kind of decisions as well? Because we do get, we do hear sort of from uh, commercial organisations concerns about the impact on them uh, in some of these areas. And, and just thinking again back to this difference of governance framework that you're now operating in. It's very difficult, isn't it? Because at the moment, um, you know, here, quite rightly, you're saying, please do more local. <laughs> and then you have local newspapers saying, you know, you are a, 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 a eating up our, a, a, lessening our revenues because we are listening to, to BBC radio. So um, I think those sorts of debates, I mean, I, I, you, will, you, you will know yourself, Baris Noel, you know, what the BBC is like in terms of data and paper and the amount of facts and, and tables that come to any board. I mean, I think I'm looking at this Thursday's board, I think it's something like 180 pages. So pl please be assured that we, as a board, evaluate the or the figures that are put before us and we also have to make these very very difficult decisions okay all right thank you lord young okay uh, mr davy um, uh, you know given the uh, budget pressures uh, what extent are such choices made about cost saving versus uh, audiences and um, I, I want to focus on one, 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 one aspect. Um, you, you pay some very large salaries. Right? I, I'm, going to, I'm going to mention one. I could mention a number, but I'm going to mention one because I think it's significant. I mean, you pay something like 1.3 million to Gary Lineker. Right? Now, however good he is, he actually isn't the asset. The asset is match of the day. I could sell match of the day anywhere, and so so could anyone else in this room. Yeah, um, 
People think they're indispensable. I remember Des Lynham saying the same thing. Jeremy Clarkson thought he was indispensable. Top Gear goes on. You know, they're not. And I've heard, I've heard before, well, you know, it's going rates. I remember when the Director General was paid 800,000 a year. I thought it was appalling. Uh, it, ri ridiculously appalling, yeah. because we were told, I, I, th I think you're very lucky. You've got one of the best jobs in the world. I totally agree with you. Full stop. Agreed. So, um, the fact that we've managed to secure you at 400,000, you know, I'm not arguing whether that's the right figure or not. Ideas in you, his You're just giving me a pay cut, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, 400 anyway. okay, plus. Right, yeah. so you, you, could, you could run Match of the Day with some really good presenters. You've got them there now. You've got some women. You've got others. I could make an even more startling suggestion. You ought to invite a young, get a young person, interview a few, get them to make a contribution on Match of the Day. It, it, there, there are other examples, but when you're, when you're being scrutinised very carefully about, and you yourself have said the, the size of the budget cuts, it's really time you took this and had a long, hard look at it, you know, about paying such extraordinary rates when there's still plenty of talent out there who would do it at a much lower, lower cost. So my sort of question is, justify, and is it a long-term policy? Um, directed to you, Tim, first of all, and then I'd, I'd probably comment from... Uh, I, I, I think overall we've done a good job taking talent pay, putting pressure on talent and senior pay. I actually don't agree that we could give it a go, but around the table anyone can do this. I actually think broadcasters, someone who has played for England, got the experience, done the thing, is, is of immense value to us. I would say, let's just set this in context for a minute, and I understand and, and respect the issues around PR challenges around it, but it's really important. We, we have 24,000 individuals who come on air and contribute on the BBC. We only have 68 who are paid more than 178, yeah? If we took them all down to say, no, more, no one gets paid more than 150,000, that would save the BBC. No, I'm not suggesting that. OK, but let's do that. It saves us five or six million pounds on a budget of 3.7 billion. It saves about five or six million pounds. Yeah? And so I understand the issues around communication, but in terms of actual hard savings, if we took it down, it's n not a very, it's not a hugely material piece, um, chunk of money in terms of the overall BBC budget. Now you could use it in other areas and I'm sure there'll be people thinking, listening to this broadcast on BBC going, well I definitely could use that money and I respect that. But that those individuals which represent 0.34% deliver about 40% of our viewing and listening. They're where the action is for most people in terms of their relationship with the BBC. And we could debate and you know, other people could present these shows some of these individuals, I believe, do a difficult job extremely well. Having said that, I just want to, instead of just saying, I sound like I'm just saying, no, 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 and here's my argument. We continually look for opportunities, and our lead presenter of Match of the Day has taken his salary down. We are looking at how we continually offer increased value for money and how we take those opportunities. There is no doubt, however, though, the market is, it may change a little bit now because it goes in and out in different situations, the market is pretty hot for talent who carry an audience. And I think that it's worth investing in at a very limited level. Okay. Uh, is there anything in particular that you wanted to add to that, Dame Annie? No, I've spent years in a university in a theatre, film and television department which actually brought out very many, quite major talents. And I just got to say to the, what the Director General just said, you know, our people make it look easy. Mm. I yes. think we just leave it at that. Okay. okay. Right. I'm sure that won't satisfy Lord Young, but... Uh, uh, no, no, well, it's test. a debate. We, we, might, we might be able to arrange a screen test at some point, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, young, by, young by name, but I'm um, getting past it, I think. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're, gonna, we're going to move on. Uh, Baroness Fraser. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think I'd better start by declaring an interest, because I'm on the board of Creative Scotland, which includes Screen Scotland. Great. Um, 
and I also run um, a Scottish charity, Cerebral Palsy Scotland. So it won't surprise you that my favourite bit of the BBC Charter is to reflect that you have to reflect, represent and serve the diverse communities of all the United Kingdom's nations and regions, and in doing so, support the creative economy across the UK. And our report, this committee's report last year, um, had it reported that data from Ofcom suggested that audiences with disabilities from Scotland and those from lower socio-economic backgrounds express lower satisfaction with the BBC. And I'm grateful to Lord Foster for sending me the, um, the figures that was provided at the time, and that you know the percentage of the audience group who thinks the BBC informs, educates, and entertains is relatively high, but the percentage of each audience group who think that the BBC is affected, effective at reflecting people like them mm -hmm. goes down to sort of 50%. So my question really is, you recognise at the time of our report that you needed to do more. You have spoken about some audiences. Um, Ms. Sumner, you talked about the over 75s. Um, but, um, you know, what have you done since we published our report? Um, and what more is there left to do? I just might, just as a sort of thing, I, I really like, Mr. Davey, your commitment to homegrown talent and growing the creative industries. How does that sit with the lift and shift that we sometimes see in Scotland about moving production um, in Scotland, not of Scotland? Um, okay, should we, should we take that at the end in terms of just, just the, 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 the relocation of people and how that works? Because um, I think there's a number of strands to that, and it might be clear you want to just talk about I am thrilled by our performance over the last two years in terms of pushing more money and power and production outside of London. And Scotland has benefited from that as well. So we can, I'll ask Claire in a minute just to give you a sense of the scale of the movements. I think then you've got another question, which is the work we're doing, and actually Claire is the executive sponsor in our own group, Ability, in terms of accessibility, making sure that um, people with disability get maximum value from the BBC. So you can tangle them up, and it's fair to tangle them, but I think there's a whole question there in terms of... One. Our, our accessibility, and we take that extreme. We're talking to the charities. We, I mean, we're doing enormous amounts of work. Actually, in the coronation, we offer different strand, uh, different streams, and things very successfully. But we have work to do. Just at a top level, by the way, that number, the BBC, for me, is an incredibly important one that we track at board level and we look at across communities. We look at across geographies. We are seeing some good movement in places um, in terms of as we move the output. Claire, do you want to just in terms of? Yeah, I, I think very briefly. Uh, the Across the UK programme that we've launched has been really successful on two key angles. One is representation and portrayal. And we know that audiences want to see themselves reflected in our content. And actually, we're kind of ahead of schedule on that because by 2024, we said that we would have more than 100 drama and comedy titles commissioned uh, outside London and really portray the UK. We've had 70 transmitted. 29 of those are from the devolved nations. And if you look at the titles, these are some of the ones that are the most watched. You know, Happy Valley, Sherwood from Scotland, Vigil, uh, Keeping Faith from Wales, and I'll do Northern Ireland as well, Blue Lights. But these have been programmes that have been incredibly successful. They've actually as well been watched quite a lot, and I know this has been a, a concern as well of this committee, uh, bringing in C2D audiences. So they have really had, I think, that connection with community and audiences that we were talking about earlier. I think the other thing we've been doing, which you've probably been perhaps noticing in the background, is making sure that our news programmes and reporters are coming from across the UK. One of the things we did invest in and make a choice around local in was investigative journalism, because that is an area where we need to go deeper and our communities want to find out more about what's happening in their areas. And then I think the other thing I would say very briefly, and you, you've touched on this, which is part of Across the UK becomes an economic engine room. You know, the licence fee, fundamentally, our principle four about the creative sector, is it's a huge stimulant. For every one pound of economic investment from the BBC, there's a £2.64 GVA. 
we hope that the Across the UK programme will have generated sort of around 850 million as a GVA number and actually supporting 50,000 jobs, which is what the BBC does across the UK, is really, really critical. So what's brilliant about this programme is you get the key connection on representation and portrayal, which I think is rightly something that makes the BBC special. This is what British audiences want. Ofcom talk about seven out of 10 audiences. They really want great British content. They want to see content that reflects themselves and their lives. And we have brilliant creatives. We're bringing in more talent from different backgrounds, including disabled writers, so that we can have really authentic storytelling in what we do. Of course, there's always more to do, and I would say that as disability champion. But of course, we are looking at these areas and we're really investing in them, which okay. is important. Can I just pick up the lift and shift, because I think yeah. it's a fair thing, which is, and I know this, you know, I'm open about this, there's some concern, you know, you relocate something and people are going up on the train line back and forth. What kind of transfer is that? You've also got an issue, which is you may just, I may be trumpeting one big production in Scotland, but if it's a six part production, being honest with you, that might be people coming in, it might be, you know, how, and, and I spent a lot of time with the various creative bodies, um, of which you're linked to one of the main ones, talking about this topic, thing how we, it's not just about the BBC, we have to be a catalyst to, if you look what happened in Salford, don't start me on creative clusters and what that takes. Now, the good news is, two things, quick points, is, we are beginning to see a kind of, because we're pushing the money out, you're beginning to see a bit of scale. So in Scotland, you, what have you got? Vigil, Shetland, Control Room, Guilt. So you begin to say, okay, I've got quite a few. Now that's the BBC doing four. Imagine if someone else does a few, and then you know, we, we're beginning to get a material change in the amount of projects based in Scotland, really important, alongside continuing drama like River City. And you can begin to see, and I'm just talking one genre, how that works. In terms of the relocation, really important. So there's something that I'm proud of, which is we, be, we to be a network editor for BBC News now, you don't have to be in London. So Zoe Kleinman has relocated. There's no lift and, you know, it is, is, there's no commuting going on. That is a team now and you can, now initially you may choose an editor that's got expertise who you're bringing in from elsewhere. But the long term game is amazing because you're beginning to, you can get talent and you can build the news hub doing network work alongside the BBC Scotland newsroom, suddenly the career opportunities, you don't have to go to London to work on network. And that changes fundamentally. If we can get at, this is what we did in Salford as well, we put real power and commissioning power outside the M25. And I, I'm really committed to that. And I think it's different to shifting one programme or one presenter moving. I just think if I could just follow up on that. Just one brief question, one really brief quickly, answer. I think, I think that's great to hear, but I would argue that 20 years ago, you know, you could have done that too, potentially. And, and my question is, um, my question is that, um, you know, given, let's just take Scotland, you know, BBC Alba, BBC yep. Scotland, you know, their audiences are dropping, it's on the front page of the newspapers, um, but they have very little user generated, their own content generated drama and all the examples you've just given us is, is about, is, yeah. In our, in our language network. So, so when we're talking about value for money, you know, there's a, there's a difficulty here about where is the, um, where is the content um, being created from? The I, I absolutely think we need to continue to, and we are evolving yeah. the, where that commissioning can come from so so what I do think is that there's a degree of wheel spin we can't afford based on our limited finances which is you've got a whole hub of activity this is not about local truly local programming but actually I'd love drama created for BBC Scotland that then has the ability to travel I have to get more of my output working on frankly earning its keep on two legs which is it's great drama for the network, sorry, in my jargon, but for the UK, but it's curiously brilliant and commissioned and coming from Scotland. We're working on that. And that is what's coming through. I, that is where it really zings, if you like, and you haven't got wheel spin, because what you can end up with, bluntly, is a lot of small projects, and we have to get the cut through. I mean, uh, we only make 30 to 40 dramas a year. The other guys can often be making 10 times that. The good news is, in drama, we're bigger than the rest of them, but. We have to do that by getting the right slots uh, and getting the right commissions. Okay, thank you. Lord Lipsy. 
Um, I uh, will return, if I may, to Gary Lineker. Not his pay, which uh, on the back of an envelope I was making out as a fraction of a farthing for each time he, for each viewer he entertains each time he appears, but about his public comments, which was the last thing to hit you in the face before um, the weekend before last. And really, I'm interested in how you're solving this rather difficult problem, because anybody who appears on television wants to be famous, and so they want to be tweeting and this, that, and the other. But on the other hand, they are, even when they're doing something privately, the person who we know from our television set, and they have to be restrained in certain ways. How are you getting on with your review of what those rules should say? Um, John Hardy's done his work on the social media review navigating and trying to understand those because you know no one wants to restrict restrict people unnecessarily i just want to make sure i've got one simple objective which is the bbc is understood by people to be duly impartial and we have different standards for the newsroom we have different standards for general staff we have this group of people who are these high profile freelance uh, community there's not that many of them and um, I think you, are, I won't repeat what you said. You're trying to articulate that and make sure that there's a reasonable framework where people can properly express views, but we're not compromising the, the um, position of the BBC in terms of delivering due impartiality. Because how we, how we facilitate free speech is because you don't know Chris Mason, how Chris Mason votes. I don't. So that is how we facilitate free speech, by him not offering a view. There, there's this issue which is when people are high profile within the BBC they're not in news is there any restriction and how that works we are pretty close to um, coming up with how we navigate that um, tightrope well uh, I mean in, in a way there's a similarity with um, Hugh Edwards because uh, they're both doing things that though they weren't perhaps intended to harm the organization for which they're working and which you have to be hot on will you promise to publish your findings and uh, instructions. The social media review will absolutely have a public... Part, part of what we need to do is have a public social media policy. I, it just if I may, I would be careful to equate any cases between uh, uh, individuals. I think the, uh, the, this is very much about the social media review, and of course we'll publish something. And um, hopefully that will be not too far away. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it's a fair point not to sit to compare those uh, two very different Thank you. pieces. I guess one thing I would, though, just push back on is uh, it was interesting that you define, if I can call it this, the Gary Lineker incidents as a uh, freedom of speech incidents, whereas for a lot of people that's an accountability. I did, I, I don't, if, I'm, if I did, I didn't mean to. Okay? What, I, what, I, what I said was there were freedom of speech questions that resulted from the incident. There, I was talking about the concept of freedom of speech, I wasn't referring to a freedom of speech incident. It, uh, it goes I, back really, to what the Lord Bishop was saying. You know, for balls, for Tim, these are difficult balancing acts and decisions have to be reached in, on a fair balance of... But um, we'll, we'll come back with a recommendation and, you know, and this, will, this is also evolving. I mean, yeah, the world of social media is not easy. I think it's also think it's about reflecting your priority of, of ensuring the BBC's you know, impartiality is, is you know... Of, of course, but this is... changed. Of course, but if I may, I want to make a point here, which is it's also about what really affects due impartiality because there's so much noise and people get offended by everything nowadays. Yeah? So we understand where is their real impact to the BBC's impartiality. This isn't just about proving ourselves that we can do this, that and the other. It's about genuinely protecting something incredibly precious, which is the due impartiality of what we do. And getting that balance right is going to be, again, I, I like to act calmly, get my way through it. It's not been easy, but we've got talented people and we're thinking our way through it. And hopefully we can find a way where we can settle that triangulates the various objectives. But it's not easy. And I think over time it will probably evolve and this is going to be an area that we'll keep coming back to, hopefully. Um, but I think it is also something where, I think when you, when you reflect on the way that some audience groups feel in terms of whether their perspectives are properly understood and respected, totally. that um, they may not distinguish between a news presenter and a very high profile presenter associated with the BBC it, expressing their exactly views. Exactly right, exactly right. And, and you know, and it does come back to that corporate accountability, which is 
an incredible, as, as I said right at the beginning, you know, accountability and independence is also not just a question for times of crises, it's an essential ingredient to the future of the BBC. I've got one short... Sorry, if I may, Chair, I just, can I just agree with... Sorry, I know there's a... Really, I totally agree with every word of that, which is I think there are responsibilities and we need a... You know, there is responsibilities when you... This is not, you know, a situation in which you can um, say... I just devolve my, devol as an institution, we devolve ourselves from the responsibility of understanding what the right framework is for this. It's really important that, and you also, it's something that you, I know you're passionate about, but I know at the BBC we're talking about all the time, which is institutions that don't really listen to people and understand, I mean, the BBC has got some strength in this because of our local operations is, you can miss it. I mean, my impartiality drive, as, as I've been very public on it, is less about pure left and right, it's often about just understanding people's perspectives across social issues, all kinds of issues where if you don't dig deep enough and you really understand different points of view, you will be found out. Okay. And the, the BBC has a responsibility to do that. I, I, by the way, I think we're really pushing on that. We're one of the only organisations in the UK to have set a social economic diversity target for our employees because we've got to have people with different views. And, you know, we're at 21.1%, we've set 25%. This is people from a lower, um, lower social economic groups. The measure is parental income at 14. You could choose a number of measures, etc., etc. It's very important. Don't get me on definitions of working class associated with parents. But any help, any help I'm more than happy to have on let, that. Let me then. just ask, Lord Foster's got a brief supplementary, and then I've got some closing remarks before we... Oh, I was no, you, you could, trying to draw your attention to the fact we're about to vote. Oh, I see. I thought I, I thought I got a message here saying oh. you were trying to you were trying to ask a question. Okay. Um, can I just ask one other brief question, which was not covered? If I could just uh, seek a, a brief answer, which is around the merger of World News and the News Channel, and the criticism that has um, attracted yeah. from many audiences. Do you have anything you can say to assure people that that is acknowledged and how that might be um, evolving in terms of? When you say criticisms from many audiences, so I just well, need to understand I mean, it, that. It's, 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 um, it's, it's led to some people expressing concerns about whether it is um, meeting the sort of you know the needs of people uh, and, and from a rolling news. I understand. I just, the reason I'm saying that is because I think we need to be led by the audience data and what we're getting back from audiences and the news team will be very responsive to that they'll always say okay is that working is that not work overall i'm happy with the merger but like any editorial offer it will keep evolving we'll keep looking at audience research and we need to make sure that we've got the right balances okay. that remains work in progress and will be ever thus i think okay all right well, um, I'm very grateful. We've covered an awful lot of ground, some of it very um, uh, high-minded, um, um, which I would always uh, expect from my colleagues here. Um, and I suppose my concluding thing is just to re-emphasise what it was that we recommended in our report last year, which is that whilst questions about future funding are um, very important and becoming increasingly urgent, what we really want to see is the BBC take the lead in uh, the debate about future funding based on a clear articulation of your strategic vision for the future. You've set out the work that you have been doing on that. We're looking forward very much to hearing the fruits of this before the end of the year. And, um, but in the meantime, very grateful to all three of you for giving up your time. And I'm particularly pleased to see Dame Lan here as the interim chair. And I, and I, I would, very much urge you as interim chair to ensure that uh, even it is an interim position, your visibility in terms of um, upholding the independence of the BBC and giving people confidence in the way in which the board is holding for the Director General and his team to account is incredibly important. Thank and we're you. very grateful I think to you can for playing a part. You can trust me on that. Mm, very will. good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Order, order. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.